please welcome the 2018 ARIA President, David Reed, and ARIA CEO, Tim Huda. Good morning, Ontario Realtors, I'll tell you. Wow, what a, what a packed house, and welcome to our 2018 reality conference here today. Good morning, folks, great to see a, a packed house today. My name is Tim Hudak, I'm the CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association. And I'm David Reed, and excited to say I'm your brand new ARIA president. <laughs> so I see some familiar faces out in the audience, but also see some new faces, which is great, because if this is your first time attending the Rea Reality Conference, it makes two of us. Because it's the first year we've had any conference like this, I'll tell you. That's right, and I'm thrilled at the size of the crowd here, and this is happening. Thrilled that you folks decided to come, and I think I know why you're all here. You want a little bit of Timberlake and Fallon and the history of rap, part one, two, three, and four. <laughs> You're here today because the world of real estate is at a critical inflection point. Change is all around us, and the pace of change is only increasing. I'm proud and I'm honored here to help lead an organization, we're prepared to take that change head on. You know, this reality conference, it's an unvarnished, it's, it's candid, it's a clear-eyed take on some of the big changes that are confronting our Canadian real estate market today. The name suits, because the reality is that rapidly evolving technology can be your greatest benefit to your business, or it can be your greatest threat. The reality is that consumers are increasingly uh, <clears throat> excuse me, increasingly demanding, they're, they're tech savvy, very sharp. The reality is that the risk of, risk of government intervention is very strong. And we need, to, uh, we need to really watch out for that, Tim. There's no doubt, the, the need to pressure them. Um, we're having some technical difficulties here. You're doing great. You know, but we're gonna keep <laughs> tap dancing. What was that, Timberlake? We'll do that as well, but uh, the reality is, you know what, it's too easy to get into our profession, really. And frankly, it's too hard to get kicked out. And as CEO, I am proud to lead a dedicated staff in service to our realtor leaders. You know, they told us we're not gonna bury our head in the sand and hope that these challenges will somehow just disappear. They're not, and we won't. We have decided to embrace change and work with you to point the way forward together. So let us show you exactly how we're gonna do that. Well, step one is getting our priorities straight. In order for us to move forward, you know, we first had to get our feet under us. And at the end of 2016, you know, we had a pretty major curveball thrown at us by our regulator recall. If I asked you what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of ARIA, I bet most of you would say it's the college. Show of hands here, how many here went to the ARIA Real Estate College? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody. Most of the room indeed, you know, because we delivered real estate education for over 30 years. But as of 2020, we're no longer in that business. That's just the bottom line. That built, dealt a big blow to our organization and frankly also impacted our identity. It also hit us financially. Look, the college was our biggest source of revenue. Now it's also our biggest cost center, but the bottom line was we have less money coming in the door at the end of the day. And that meant basically we had to blow up our business. So here's what we did and what it means to you. As CEO, I reduced the size of our senior and middle management by 40%. We got rid of expensive consultant contracts for work that we could, quite frankly, do a lot better ourselves. David and Ed Ture and Ray Ferris, Karen Cox and the board, they show that leadership starts at the top. 
they reduced their expenses by 25%. And they gave us a mandate at ARIA staff to cut our own budget, so we reduced our travel and hospitality budget by 50%. And look, we did that not only because it was the right thing to do, but we did that because we could then reinvest every one of those dollars back into services that matter to you, our members. Invest in things like advocacy, government relations, the standard forums that you use each and every day, and reinvest in conferences like this. We are leaner and sharper to take on those new realities that David walked us through moments ago. And step two is what we're, we're demanding better in our professional standards. The rules that govern our business, frankly, they're out of date. 2002, when our first set of rules, REBA, were written, I can't remember the minister at the time that was involved with that, but... Uh, young fellow back then. Yeah, good looking fellow too, I hear. So he told me. Set the bar for professional standards. In fact, ARIA really helped set that bar. But our real estate market's not what it was in 2002. You know what the price, the average price of a home in Toronto, Tim, in 2002? Slightly over $275,000. What are you gonna buy for that today? Nothing. Any of you use a fax machine recently? <laughs> you know, I think there's one back there, David, I said. Yeah. You know, but fax machines, they were one of the main ways that deals got done back in 2002. And I, in fact, I talked to somebody, they said it was a godsend because suddenly, back where we are, people were driving to see cottages and winds, or had to drive all over the place. And at the time, the fax machine was revolutionary. But not anymore. We need rules that are written for electronic signatures and cloud computing, smartphones, not fax machines. But it isn't just our business practices either. It's our ethical standards. Who here saw CBC Marketplace story? You know, some were caught breaking the rules. Sure as hell not all of us, but it's amazing how they paint such a wide picture, paint with wide brush. We saw it, and we're not pulling any punches here. You know, when people tear up the rules and violate the trust of our Ontario families, trying to make the biggest purchase of their lives, they should lose their ability to practice, frankly, and not just a slap on the wrist. And we didn't just talk the talk at Rio, we walked the walk. We convinced the government of Ontario to modernize REBA and get with the times. And Rio has a main seat. Here are some of the things that we've put on the table for the government. As David said, higher fines and the ability for RICO to suspend or remove licenses for egregious violations. We put on the table the concept of putting an end to the builder exemption to sell new developments without a real estate license. It should be realtors selling those properties. And also creating a new class license for realtors who are going to specialize in commercial real estate. All in all, what we stand to gain by raising our standards is an increasingly trusted profession that home buyers and sellers are going to respect. Because you know when it comes to making the biggest purchase that people make in their lifetimes, they want a human being. They want a person they trust. They want somebody who knows their data cold, who understands people and who will fight for them. That's what they want, a human being, not some machine. So to get that right, we launched the biggest consultation that we've ever done in our history. It's called REBA Reform. Join us, rebareform.ca. Tell us how best to raise the bar, and then we take it to government, and we get the job done. That's right. And moving on, step three is what we need to do is we need to stop governments from doing something stupid. Been there, done that. <laughs> Look, we've, uh, we, I know we've worked with politicians of all stripes and truly believe that most politicians, 
get into public life because they want to make a positive difference for their communities. I know that was certainly true for and Tim here, but you know what, real estate's a complex business and, and if decision makers don't, get, don't have the right information, they can make some costly mistakes. There's no doubt about it. And Maria set a very ambitious goal that when it comes to advocacy in Ontario, we want to be number one. And our members and families who put their life savings into their home, they deserve no less from us. At Aria, we are on a mission, championing the Canadian dream of home ownership. And along that mission, stopping government intervention that would stand in the way of people finding the best place to call home. You know, out of the gate, we had some immediate success. We convinced the government to double the land transfer tax rebate for first time home buyers. So that meant that in some parts of the province, first time home buyers, they pay no land transfer tax whatsoever. It's a big step forward, right? But there's still work to be done, particularly in Toronto and the big cities, the land transfer tax can still be punishing. So we are pushing for further relief to be in the election platforms of all three political parties. Well, I think a lot of you were here yesterday and you got to hear from former BC Premier Christy Clark. They moved to eliminate double ending in British Columbia everywhere, except for some of the real small remote areas. And, and government looked to do the same thing here. And we heard the odds were certainly stacked against us. We had CBC, Toronto Star, our regulator, they all wanted it banned in Ontario too. But that kind of ban doesn't make sense for consumers. You know that, I know that. And I know from personal experience that the, the practice of multiple representation it can work when it's done properly. And taking away a, a buyer or seller's right to choose who they want to work with certainly wasn't the answer, Tim. I'm a consumer. And you know, when Deb and I bought our house recently, we took on the job at Aria. Well, check this out. Uh, beautiful, eh? It's my little girls, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the first walkthrough that you get once you buy the house. Look how happy they were. And my realtor, Peter McClellan, I think Peter's in the room here today, he did a hell of a job for us. So the house we sold, we got more money than I would have guessed. And the beautiful house we bought, we paid less. Peter did a fabulous job. And as the girls get bigger and we want a bit more space, we want to upgrade, Peter's got a listing, I want to be able to use him again. People should have the right to work with a realtor they know, they trust, they like, they've done business with, and government has no business getting in the way. Each and every day, we are fighting for more housing supply in the marketplace. Wherever you go in Ontario, inventory is a significant issue. And look, while the market may be a bit quieter today, this time, than it was last year, the fundamentals of demand are still very strong. Just think about who you're fighting for every day. That millennial, she's done everything right, she got her degree, she landed a good job, but she's still stuck in mom and dad's basement. You're fighting for that new Canadian family, full of talent, excited to come to a new country to get ahead, but they can't afford a home. And you're fighting for Canadians who are coming from all across Canada to come particularly to the Greater Golden Horseshoe where the economy is stronger than elsewhere in our country, to provide for their families. You're fighting for them every day. <clears throat> and at Aria, we're fighting for them too. Yeah, but governments, they need to focus on the real problem, really, and that's, we're not building enough housing supply to keep up with the demand. And the key to unlocking the affordability problems, more homes and, and a greater number of choices. Happy to say that, you know what, Aria, we were on the front line of this debate in 2017. You know, the government used a lot of our ideas, including construction along rail lines. You know, building more of that missing, missing middle, as I know you've heard Tim speak many times on the radio, and targeting infrastructure to where people actually want to live. Our focus plan to stand up for realtors, and for homeowners, and those that want to join their ranks 
is having a lot of success. But as anything in life, there is still more work to be done. One example is personal real estate corporations. Thanks to some effective or modern lobbying efforts by our leadership and our team, legislation to allow for personal real estate corporations for realtors has gone the farthest it's ever gone at Queens Park. It was a really cool day. Many of you were there in the legislature when we had members from all three parties together voting for our bill. We've got it right up to the finish line. Just need to help you push it over that line. Should I tell them about the other good news this week? I'm, I'm sure they'd be interested to hear if they don't know already. So I got a letter. <laughs> so have you heard about the mandatory home energy audits in Ontario? <laughs> Not everybody, right? So the provincial government had promised to implement a province-wide mandatory home energy audit scheme. So basically, in plain language, what they had in mind was that anybody who wanted to sell their home would have to do a mandatory energy audit before they could even list. Like imagine how that would work. A seller couldn't list her home until the energy auditor comes in there, does the inspection, does the report. You couldn't even list. And think of that senior citizen. You know, maybe her husband passed away. She was relying on that hard-earned equity in her home. A low energy score or a shady operator could cost her thousands and thousands of dollars in those precious retirement savings. Obviously, that would be very bad news for home sellers, so we fought against it. I remember seeing David Reed and Etri Cardarelli and John Odie, our government relations chair, in action. I had a ringside seat as they talked directly to cabinet ministers and explained why this made no sense. It's bad for homeowners, it's bad for the Ontario real estate market. And two days ago, I got a letter from the Minister of Energy saying, because of our efforts, they're putting the brakes on that bad audit program. I think they wanted to hear that good news, Tim. <laughs> you know, when you want a government to make the right choice for your business, that shows there's nothing like strength in numbers. And that's why we formed the Ontario Realtor Party. It's a big opportunity for local leaders like those of you that are in this room just to, to get involved. You know, and our, the Realtor Party gives you the opportunity to very easily reach out and email your MPP and respond to calls for action and, and easily phone your MPP. So if you haven't already, please take a second and join at OntarioRealtorParty.com. See, that reminds me. Do you know another reason why I love realtors? No. I, I want to hear it. Tim. They're the only profession in the province that has more lawn signs than the politicians. <laughs> uh, so take out your phones if you have a chance. I know I saw a lot of you had it when he was talking. <laughs> Go to OntarioRealtorParty.com, you know. But honestly, you know, it is serious. 2018, it's going to be a big year for both provincial and municipal elections. So together, you know, we can stand up homeowners and buyers, for homeowners and buyers. Otherwise, frankly, we can get run over. So step four is helping you to succeed in this period of, as you know, rapid change. And that's one of our main goals here at our reality conference. We want to introduce everybody to some of the new technologies that are out there and some of the new ways of doing business and, and some potential new partners for you. Yeah, look, sure, we've all heard the buzzwords, right? Blockchain, artificial intelligence, clouds, chatbots. The truth of the matter is that these things are already impacting the way that you do business on a daily basis. But more importantly, they're changing the way that buyers and sellers expect us to do business. Uh, look, Frank, we heard from critics, didn't we? You know, there's always a few critics. One some, or two. Yeah. Some said, you can't invite Zillow to your conference. Don't bring in the disruptors. I guess the view, frankly, was that if we closed our eyes, that our reality could somehow change. But instead, what did we do? We wanted to give you the opportunity to judge for yourselves. You know, what's Google Labs, Google Sidewalk Labs, actually, is that what does that mean for urban development? We're going to hear from them later today. 
It will Airbnb be a tool for buyers to upgrade their home or get that cottage they always dreamed about? Well, you make the call. You know, will these new technologies and these approaches work for you? Well, will they help you help more people find a place to call home? Judging by the size of the crowd here, Tim, I think we made the right call. I can't even see to the back. Made the right call. The conversation doesn't begin and end here, though. We have a series of events called Emerge, and that's going to continue this year and going forward. Think of Emerge like many reality conferences, and there are going to be four of them in the different regions of the province. One of them is going to be in Muskoka. Somebody had a bit of pull. <laughs> So they're going to be in Muskoka, in London, in Ottawa, and in Durham. And on top of, oh, some Durham. <laughs> it's a little trick, shout out the community. Yeah, we got London, four from Muskoka, Ottawa. two from Durham. We got, we got six people. <laughs> yeah. And um, we're also going to be doing two commercial emerges as well. So focused on commercial real estate and the impact of technology. So they're going to be in Hamilton and right here in Toronto. Yeah, and, and there's another, there's another thing on, that we can do to help build your business, and that's Take on a leadership position, which I know quite a few of you in the room have. I remember I first joined our local board, Tim. I, like many of you, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to my association initially, and unless my MLS system went down, <laughs> you know, and uh, I honestly didn't even realize how the three levels of real estate worked. Sounds like confessional here, but uh, it's the truth. And getting plugged into the leadership courses at Aria really helped to clarify the different roles that that your, your local and your provincial and your national association have. And as a major bonus, I gotta say how, how wonderful it is to meet so many great people across the province, which I'm very blessed and thankful for. I look forward to meeting some more of you this year too. At the heart of Aria and our 38 member boards across our province are amazing volunteers like David Reed. People who contribute their time, their energy, they move the profession forward. So we run something called the Aria Center for Leadership Development. And what we do there is we recruit and empower strong realtor leaders in every city, town, or village in Ontario. And let me tell you something that I've learned from my 21 years of service in public life. I've seen pretty well every association across the boardroom table or in action in communities. But I defy you to find another profession that is more involved in their communities than Ontario Realtors. I, like I've seen it in action, right? Coaching the hockey team, baseball, gymnastics, soccer, figure skating. Who's involved in the school council? Who's involved in the local food bank? Who's involved in every church, temple, synagogue, or gurdwara in the province of Ontario? It is Ontario realtors who are building strong communities each and every day. And the fact that all these folks are here means that they're already involved. You want to get going and take on the big changes that have come upon us. And David, I can say with full confidence, we're seeing before us the current and future leaders of our profession. You're here is because the reality is you're not afraid of change. You're here to listen, to learn, to network, to embrace change, and to succeed. Well, as they say, you don't, you don't build a business, you build people, and they'll build the business. And since you agree with us here today, you know, we know they're significant threats to our profession, but we have a plan to overcome them. We're going to raise the professional standards. We're going to double down on advocacy and empower you with technology and tools. And that's what we're all about. And judging by the energy here in the room today, we know we have the realtor team to be leaders in that changing landscape. And this conference is all about our current reality and, and no doubt the challenges that are ahead for us. And, I think it's important to remember opportunities, Tim, often come 
disguised his challenges. So I'm going to finish with a story about Kenneth Cole. How many of you know Kenneth Cole? You might know it's a company many of you likely know. Well, it was originally called Kenneth Cole Incorporated. He started back September 1982. Didn't have a lot of money. He had some ideas, though. So he's trying to get into the shoe market. Look at me up here on stage talking about shoes. <laughs> Who would have thought? You know, he had his new brand of shoes, and he's trying to get into the shoe event of the year, which was held in New York City. It's called Market Week. It's at the Hilton. So he found out there's no way in hell he could afford to <laughs> afford to have a suite there where he could showcase anything. So he went to a friend of his in New York City and said, look, it, if I can find a place to park, would you lend me a 40-foot trailer? He's like, <laughs> not only will I lend it to you, I'll decorate it for you. He said, there's no chance in hell you can't even park a bike in New York City for 10, for 10 seconds, let alone a 40-foot trailer for a week. So he goes off to the city looking for a permit. And they say, they kind of laughed at him too. He said, look, unless you're a utility company, or a movie company filming a movie, there's no way in hell you're getting a permit for a 40-foot trailer out in front of the Hilton. So what's he do? There's a challenge ahead of him. He quickly changes the name of his company to what it is today, Kenneth Cole Productions. Went back to the city, got a permit. What's he do? He films the movie called The Birth of a Shoe Company outside of the Hilton in his friend's 40-foot decorated truck. What's the end result? In two and a half days, he sold 40,000 pairs of shoes, Holy. shooting his company up to almost a billion dollar company within about 10 years. So that was some challenges for Kenneth Cole, just like we have challenges before us. So that come disguised, disruptors. You know, these can be overcome too. We face them in our own marketplace. And we're excited that you're here today to hear about them as well, because we promised you an unvarnished, an honest, and a clear-eyed view. And that's what we plan to deliver here today, Tim. And if you want to learn more about all the fantastic things that we've accomplished over this last year under President Ettore Cardarelli and where we're going as an association, be sure to check out areayearinreview.com. Enjoy the conference, everybody. And thank you ever so much for coming today. So. Great day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Tony Chong. Good morning, everybody. Before I begin, I have to tell you that I, get, I have an, the great privilege of going around the world. I work with leaders of large companies and small companies. I've gotten to know Tim Hudak over the years. I wish he was running for government. You're lucky to have somebody that's got his humility, his will, his personality, his intelligence manning the rudder of this association. Tim, thanks for having me. So in the next 45 minutes, I want to go on an adventure. I want to get you out of this room. I want to get you out of the present. I want to get your minds away from the deals that you're doing. I want to get you to put the screens aside because together we're going to uncover one of the most powerful communication platforms known to the human beings. It's a platform so powerful and versatile that not only are you going to discover today, you're going to learn how to master it. It's going to build your business. It's going to improve your relationship with your clients. It's going to allow you to disrupt the disruptors that want to take away your business. If I'm going to join you on this quest, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I found my calling at a very young age. First job, I had a briefcase with my initials on it. I got to sell for a local radio station in Montreal, the West Island. I loved this job. I had my naps, I had my briefcase packed with everything about that radio station. The DJs, their pictures, I had posters, I had all the information and all the ratings. I remember one morning driving up St. John's Boulevard, Pierrefonds. I see this sign. Opening soon, a restaurant. What an opportunity for a cold call. I pull in. I walk in, and if anybody's ever sold real estate into the restaurant business, two weeks before our opening, it's just carnage. It looks like it'll never get done. I wade through the equipment and the people running around. I find the owners. I, I give them my best pitch, and they say, we don't have any money for advertising. We're, we are all in. All our chips are on the table. We're taking our grandmother's rib recipe, and we're staking our future on it. So I'm walking to the door, I'm dejected, and just before I get out the door, I hear, hey, kid, 
are you hungry? I turn around, they said, we're just bringing out a test plate of ribs. Love to see what you think of them. Oh man, these, these were among the best ribs I ever had. Next day I happened to show up at pretty well the same time and I got their southern chicken and biscuits and gravy. And by day three, I'd built enough of a relationship by convincing them to buy a $300 summer safety radio advertising package. 15 30 second ads, 15 bumpers on safety tips. I was all in. I made sure it was the best ads, the best announcer, convinced and, and conned my way into getting the best drive time. I show up opening night. I walk in. Not a soul is there. The husband, the wife, a few friends, a couple of angel investors. Then I hear the door open. Then I hear it open again. And before you know it, this place was slammed. It was jammed. I was busking tables, doing anything I could to help out. And more than once, I asked this question, how did you hear about it? They said, we heard about it on the radio. And I realized I'd found a purpose, connecting buyers and sellers together. But the next 30 years, I built two advertising agencies, a research firm. And five years ago, I sold all of it so I could speak my mind in the media and at conferences like this. Through my entire career, from the radio station to today, there's one word that matters to all of us. In fact, it is the oxygen of all human endeavor. It is the lifeblood of sales. And that word is attention. See, when you have attention, you breathe opportunity. You can inspire, you can motivate, you can educate, you can excite. An actor can make you laugh. You, when you have attention as a salesperson, you can engage your clients head, heart, and hands, how they think, they feel, and they behave. The challenge nowadays is the headwinds. It's so hard to get attention. We're living in this age of noise where too much and too many is chasing a finite amount of time. We're asking humans to drink content from a fire hose, and so much of what we have to say, our ideas, our strategies, our marketing material just gets spilled on the floor. We're also dealing in an age where the consumer has seized power. This mobile phone is like a magic wand. Anything they want to conjure in the universe is within arm's reach of desire. They spend up to one in seven days, and people say, hell, that's possible. Well, they can play, they can shop, they can peruse, they can validate, they can get likes, they can get information, they can take away your currency that you used to have because you used to have a briefcase of knowledge. You had all the information. That's what made you important to them. But now they can bring all of that in. And the third thing we're dealing with in terms of attention is a lack of trust. We've seen this growing divide in society. We're seeing this, this great divide where people aren't trusting each other anymore. We're not trusting our politicians. We're not trusting brands. I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago we would sleep in strangers' beds? It's called Airbnb. We drive in strangers' cars, Uber. People hook up with strangers on, on the internet. The world has moved from the sense of being together to suddenly growing apart. And all of this, these headwinds, have changed our marketplace and we've changed it permanently. There is no middle ground. There, there, there's no status quo, there's no place to hide, there's no hope that uh, in the future things will get better. You have a choice to make as an individual. You have a choice to make if you own a firm. The choice is to either transform, make things happen, be relevant, or be a transaction. That's where the world's dividing, transformation and transaction. Nothing is surviving the middle. If you're in the transaction business, you will be disrupted. If you're just in the business of doing deals, papering deals, making sales, you will be disrupted because right now there's probably 10,000, if not 100,000 people trying to create apps to be faster, better, and cheaper than you. Because that's what a transaction is. It's about speed, it's about accuracy, and it's about lowering the cost. And they will come at you time and time again. However, and you'll see your commission. However, if you're in the business of this transaction, I can also tell you you're in the business of making a lot of excuses. I hear it all the time. I hear, I hear excuses in saying, you know, in the restaurant industry, all the minimum wage has gone up, rent's ex getting expensive, food costs, bureaucracy. I'm sure in your world you're talking about fees and you're talking about government. These are the realities of doing business nowadays. I will not sugarcoat the message. If you stay in the trans transaction side and you live on the excuses side, you will become redundant. 
But if you find your way into the transformation side, if you, if you find a way to change your business of doing business, and I'm sure many of you are already in this role, you have got such an incredible life ahead of you. See, the difference between in transformation is you're not going over a cliff trying to compete with machines. Your relevancy becomes yours because you focus instead on what you do to matters of the heart. You focus on what is really important to your client. I learned this about 12 years ago. I was sitting in an audience, and there was this incredible speaker. And he talked about the need to get unplugged, just to cl clear his mind. And his way of doing it was hiking. He loved solo hiking without GPS. He just liked to find his way around things. And he was such a great teacher. He, he talked about putting on his boots and what it felt like to get out of the car on the pavement. They just felt awkward. And then as he started getting onto the beaten path, he could feel the gravel. And eventually, he was one with nature. And he talked about this morning of being one of those mornings we love, you know, where the temperatures, if you're in the sun, it warms you up and you want to delayer. And in the shade, it's just got that little bit of chill. And he's walking along. He's hearing nature. His mind's decluttering. And he's just feeling like he's finally won. And he turns the corner and he stumbles upon this rock quarry. This juxtaposition, he went from the, the, the perfect sounds of nature to looking and seeing half a mountain being defaced. People are running up and down looking like ants, the dust and the acid. But he has to get through it to get to where he has to go. So he's walking through it and he's kind of feeling awkward. He, he, he comes up to the first person and says, what are you doing? Man, I'm cutting rock. Goes up to the second person, asks the same question, gets the same answer. Goes to the third person, woman, shining eyes, doing the exact same job. He asks the exact same question. And she says, I'm part of a team building a great cathedral. Now, he took one of the oldest stories known. They've been telling this story for thousands of years. But it, it changed the way I approached business. I realized as a person in an advertising agency, I was doing a lot of things to get clients and consumers to buy my clients' products. But they weren't really buying in. They, were, they, they weren't part of something bigger. So I started looking and saying, what is the difference? Why would one person say I'm part of a great cathedral and be part of this transformation that was happening while the other two were focused on transactions? And I realized, realized it had to do with stories. Somebody had swept her away from the day in and day out of pounding of rocks and, and talked about what this cathedral would do, how it would unite a community. She had a seat at the table with the architects and the planners, the people carving the, the doors, making the stained glass windows. She was part of something bigger. She had purpose. So I said, is stories the answer? Can, is stories what can change the conversation? Take that fire hose and move it away and have people pay attention. Well, I started thinking about stories and how they draw you in. They fire emotions. Talk about the, the, the people in our life are their great storytellers. Stories are so powerful, they can actually change cultures. October 14th, 1948, three years after World War II, man had yet to fly at the speed of sound. And if I could take you back then, half this room, you didn't want it. That was God's territory. The planet would explode. The pilot wouldn't survive. But the other had, had an appetite for change, including this guy and the team. The right stuff. This is Chuck Yeager. Saturday morning, he gets out of bed, and he says, this is our day. I want the game ball. Broken ribs, didn't matter. He took off, and this is what he said in his autobiography. I knew it was the day. I let that plane go, and I decided today it was her day to fly. And I just pointed it up, and I took in all the sights. And boy, did we fly. I kept looking down at the gauge and looking up, and then I heard what I've always dreamed to hear, the sonic boom. For the first time ever, man was flying at the speed of sound. But it was a perfectly paved speedway. A, a poke through jello. Grandma could be sitting beside me sipping lemonade. Later, much later, I realized that those berries had never been in the sky, but always in our minds. They used that story for decades later, any time NASA engineers said, that can't be done. Are the barriers in the sky or in your mind? You know, stories are so powerful as a vehicle for communication, they actually can change your brain waves. So let's say for a second that, what's your name? 
Brent, let's say Brent and I are really good friends. We get together every Saturday and we have coffee. And I walk in, Brent says, oh, what'd you do last night? And I go, uh, I had something to eat. Well, your Brent has incredible brain. Matter of fact, everybody in this room is incredible because you can decipher those words and know that I ate. But if I walked into that coffee shop, I said, Brenda, you remember last year we went to that bistro? Well, last night, coming home, starving. I walked by and I said, I had a... I opened the door. The thing was just bursting with energy, man. This thing was just happening. The buzz. One chair left at the bar. I squeezed in there. And you know how much I love my craft beer. Well, it served little chips of ice on the top. Bartender said, what do you feel like eating? I said, I don't know, maybe a burger. Said, have you ever had beef bourguignons? I haven't had beef bourguignons since my grandmother made it. You got to try it. Brenda, <laughs> ceramic dish, thick crust of bread, gravy that just was so beautiful and rich and brown. You know, the kind that you just, you're not going to leave a drop. Chunks of meat that just melt in your mouth, the grilled mushroom, these white onions that burst. When I tell you a story like that, a couple of things happen. I fire your sensory cortex. You start relating to it because you've had gravy like that or meat like that or, or you're interested in pottery and you imagine the dish. I fire your motor cortex and you come with me to the bar. I get you to leave your present and I get you to come with me. So I started looking at this and saying, well, stories is the answer. How do we work in sales to make stories work for us? So the first person I went to and I looked at was one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, Steven Spielberg. Anybody remember this movie? Right? 41 years later, I've been to the beach 4,000 times. I still don't go in the water. Every, every time I see a paddleboard, I think that just is an appetizer out there for Jaws. It's true, though. But the thing about Jaws, I said, why does that work? Why do we remember it? And it works because every story that we fall in love with has a hero, a protagonist. And very often, if you're a great writer or a great storyteller, you just make the hero as normal as possible. This is Sheriff Brody. He hated being a big city cop, wanted to go to a simple fishing village, watch his kids grow up, hand out a few parking tickets, tell people not to launch bonfires. That story would last about a minute and you get bored with Brody. Something has to happen in a story that makes the protagonist or the hero leave the normality. And this will come so clear in how it's going to help you with your business. So what happens is there's a calling. There's a knock on the door. Gandalf shows up. Fairy godmother shows up. In this case, a shark shows up and takes down two tourists. So now he's got to go on a quest. And this is where stories get interesting. The challenges, overcoming obstacles, battling. When we talk about our life and our career, it's our quest that we remember and talk about. Well, you go on a quest, but a great story. You can't have Brody go on his own. You need helpers, enablers, mentors. In this case, you've got the, uh, the marine biologist Hooper and one of the great characters of all time, Quint, who owns the boat. They go off, they battle, they look like they're going to die. One of them dies. It goes on and on for two hours. Your heart's beating. At the end, there's resolution. The shark is taken down. We go back to normal. This arc happens all the time in almost every story we watch. But what's important to you in this room is the why. What, what, what can storytellers use to make it convincing that this normal life, I'm willing to go on a quest. I'm willing to change and throw everything up in the air to go after something. And it really comes down to the four hierarchies of needs. The first one is safety and security. You know, you think about Home Alone, or you think about the movies where you're trying to defend. Almost every superhero movie is about saving the planet. That's a big storyline. The next one's about love and belonging. I'm not just talking about romantic love. I'm talking about belonging together, Braveheart, where we're going to unite. We're one. Association like this is about belonging. And then there's stories that are about, I'm going to go search for treasure. I have a greater purpose, the Harry Potter sagas of the world. And then there's self-actualization, where you, you, through in somebody else's eyes, you learn something about yourself. So I looked at this concept, and I said, does it work for brands? Is this the secret sauce that allows us to get attention and engage and shape how think, people think, feel, and behave? Can we possibly just be as simple as using the story arc, the hero, going on a quest, helpers, and resolution with these basic needs? Can we put them together? Is that possible? Do we need a Steven Spielberg $100 million budget? Do we need the penmanship of a William Shakespeare? Or can the simplicity of this idea work in even 60 seconds?
When I wake up, well, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who wakes up next to you. And when I go out, yeah, I know I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the man who goes along with you. <coughs> Now, I'm still not sure how he, at dawn he changed the coffee for a Budweiser and they got that through advertising standards. But think of this storyline. The hero's the dog. What a great life. Why would you ever want to change man's best friend, the Clydesdales is your buddies? Suddenly the normality shattered, gets lost. You go through a series of challenges, pouring rain, trying to find shelter. You're just at the point where the dog sees the farm and then yet again, about to be eaten by the wolf, and the enablers come to the rescue. By the way, if you like that story, watch Toy Story 3, where Woody gets abandoned, and Lassie comes home, and thousands of others that have followed that exact same arc. But what I learned, and this is where it's all starting to come together for you, is that the great marketers and salespeople never make the hero in the story themselves. It's never about you. It's about me. That if they want your attention, they have to help the consumer to get to where they want to go. Is there any sports fans in this audience? Right? Uh, can you imagine being a sports fan? You, you live in a small flat in Paris, but somehow or another you convinced people that you, you need room for your shrine, all your memorabilia. You've never missed a home game in 30 years. You can. If you get you're talking about it, you can recount every major moment in those 30 years. But you've never once had a chance to see your team play. Bah non, il n'y a pas un matin où je me lève où je n'y pense pas. Hein. Pour moi, le foot, c'est le foot, c'est l'OM. Voilà. C'est à moi, c'est ma vie, c'est mon club, c'est dans mes tripes. Alors, ma femme et ma fille, elles se foutent souvent de moi. Mais... Et depuis 30 ans, j'ai pas raté un match à domicile, pas un. En même temps, j'en ai pas vu une seule. Et pourtant, je, je me souviens de tout, hein. de tout, tout, tout. Le bruit de la tête de Basile Bouy en 93 hein, contre Paris. Hein. Les filets qui tremblent, le stade qui chavire, le... la joie des joueurs. Vous pouvez pas savoir ce que c'est d'être aussi près de vos idoles et de pas pouvoir les voir. Et puis un jour. You know, we spend a lot of time in Canada talking about who has the fastest network. How many G's have you got? How many screens you can play the content on? But these people changed the conversation and consideration because their network didn't matter until it mattered to me. You know, the thing that I want to impress on you today is it takes great humility and will to say, I'm not the hero. I'm there to help my client get to where they want to go. I, I'm going to put and my eyes and what you do for a living. You know, I want to talk about how many houses I've sold and how successful I am and, and all the things that matter to me. I think that the future and the transformation is saying, what can you do that matters most to where I'm heading in life? People talked about Steve Jobs as the great technologies. He hated technology. Couldn't stand technology. When, uh, when he brought the iPod out, Sony Walkman owned portable music. How many people used to jog with a CD player on your hip? Remember that? And they had all the soundboards like you're like a DJ. When he brought out the iPod, he, he, he said, I don't want anything to do with technology. 
I want to make this so simple to use. And his promise to you was very, the most elegant advertising ever done. It was about 10,000 songs in your pocket and 10,000 songs in your pocket. His phone was, what's on your pl playlist? What are your apps? His technology helped to get to where you want to go. So yeah, beer can do it, big cable companies. How about everyday products? Before we even get into sales. And how many people have vacuumed out here? We, we've all vacuumed, right? I hope we've vacuumed. So when you're vacuuming, is this not you and you're going along, you're vacuuming, maybe you're listening to some music and then you catch something? What do you do? You, you kind of smile. Like, what, what did I catch? What, what did I suck up? So when the vacuum cleaner industry was asleep, Hoover owned it, Electrolux owned it, a guy called Dyson comes along and he says, you know what? People actually enjoy vacuuming because they feel purposeful. They spend all their day punching keyboards and on their screens. They don't know what they're doing anymore. So why don't we let him see the dirt? And he created a clear canister. Multi-billionaire. Got into the fan business, got into everything other business, but a simple insight, because instead of what mattered to him as engineering, he focused on what mattered to the consumer. And I said, well, okay, I want to get as, as commodities as you can. I spent 30 years, Pepsi was a client. We hated Evian. Evian was like just the most pretentious brand. Glass bottle, sourced from the French Alps, everything was a French accent. But they got away with it for a while, and one day the consumer woke up and disrupted their business by saying it's just water. And Evian was smart enough and had the courage enough to stop talking about their glass and their source and instead focus on why water matters to you. So, focusing on the fountain of youth, was that engaging? Well, 250 million downloads. Apps where you could become the baby in the ad. Whole new strategy at retail, superbly executed, because they focused on what mattered most to the individual, hydration, versus what they thought was their reason for being, which is the fact that it was a glass bottle. So does this work for sales? Before we get right into your industry, I, you know, do you need production value? Do you need to be an engineer like Dyson to make it work? The interesting thing about it is it works better for sales than anywhere else. I'll give you two examples. I was working with the Holt Renfrew Group. For a while, they had a perfectly paced speedway. There was no disruption. They were the luxury retailer. And a couple of things happened. First of all, our Canadian dollar for a short time strengthened in 2007 and became more expensive than the, uh, it had more value than the American dollar. So all their customers could go down to New York now and shop without being punished with the currency. And then some of their biggest brands started setting up their own stores because they didn't like they weren't getting enough attention at Holt Renfrew. And then the internet came along. And Holt Renfrew started to almost go on life support. And we got involved in the organization and I spent a lot of time observing their salespeople. Very often a customer would come in, first of all, if you weren't dressed the part, you rarely got served, but customers would come in and say, let's say, woman come up and say, I'm looking for a pair of uh, skinny J brand jeans. And the person would look up and say, yeah, they're over there. Well, they're not over there anymore. They're right here on my phone. You're, if you think that this transaction is easy, going to a store and going up an escalator when I can buy on this, you're mistaken. So I started working with them saying, why don't you just simply engage the customer and say, why, what's that? Oh, I'm going skiing. Oh, pray ski party? Have I got an outfit for you? 
I could go in there and say, I had a great speech coming up, and I'm thinking of a pair of new flashy socks. What kind of speech? How many people? I, you got a few minutes? I want to show you a suit that's going to rock. We taught them how to sell into the customer's moments. We let them know that their role in the story was the fairy godmother. They didn't get to go to the ball. They just got to dress Cinderella. And the salespeople that transformed, their commissions didn't go up 8% or 15%. Some of them had five or 600% increases because instead of being in the transaction side and pointing to people like some kind of signpost, they spent what mattered most, that people, when they went out at night, when they went to the schoolyard, when they went to business meetings, they wanted to own the mark, own the moment. Working with entrepreneurs, and at the end I said, any questions? And one person stood up, very awkward and tall person, it was just weird, it was almost, you know, surreal. And he said, I love your, love your talk, Tony. I was just kind of smiling, I'm glad he liked the talk. He said, but you can't help me. It's not really what you want as a question. I said, what's up? He said, you know, I'm in the custom front door business. I said, fantastic. He said, yeah, my grandfather started, hated carpentry, but really loved to create custom doors. And my dad took it over and scaled it up. We have a little plant with some contractors, some trucks. I said, fantastic. He said, well, my sister and I bought this business about a year and a half ago, and I'm not sure we're going to make payroll in four months. I said, what's, what's, what's going on? He said, we're being disrupted. I said, well, how are you being disrupted? He said, well, they're bringing in doors from the overseas and selling them in Canada for cheaper than we can make them. I said, are they the same doors? And all of a sudden, the selfish team, said, hell no, he actually dropped the F-bomb. Hell no. Solid oak, hand-mounted hinges, the best fixtures. So I stopped and I said, well, stop selling doors. And the audience was like, we paid this guy to come out. This is his family business. So you're not in the door business. You're not in the door business. A customer comes in and every day they're reading and hearing about the crime in the neighborhood, you're in the drawbridge business. When you put your front door and they install it, nobody gets through it. Millennials come in and just bought a, their first home deep in debt, but they're dreaming of what this house is going to be. I said, you're in the first impression business. They might not be able to afford all the renovations, but every time they walk through your door, every time they close, every time they invite anybody in, it's going to signal possibilities. See, in sales, it's not just showing people that you can help getting to where to go. It's becoming their Yoda. This is the advantage sales have in the storytelling. Because in advertising, we have to fabricate the mentor. In movies, we have to create the characters. But in the world of stories and real people, the Yoda factor, helping Luke Skywalker have the courage to defeat the evil empire is the role you're going to play. So let's talk about your business of doing business in real estate. Let's talk about this concept of storytelling, this arc, and let's talk about these human needs. So the hero, what knocks at the door, the quest, the mentor. The, the, the one thing I would say about your industry, I think a lot of you like to think you're the hero. I think a lot of you really like to position yourself. I see things like this all the time. I'm number one. I've done this. I've done that. I call this humble bragging. I call this ridiculous bragging. <laughs> you know, you have your pictures out there. You, 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 it, I know, it's hard to believe. <laughs> the, the hero in this story is the people buying or selling, residential or commercial. They are the heroes. They're the ones that are putting the chips on the table. They're the ones taking on the risk. They're the ones that might have borrowed for their family and friends. These people are, are true heroes for moving into real estate. Your job has got to be the Yoda. And I can't think of a better industry to be a Yoda because you play against two of the most important things in life. My life. Like a, a house is a Trojan horse. It, it, it opens up possibilities. The reason we are here as human, humans is because we found a way to create nests. We found a way to take care of ourselves. We didn't have to be nomadic anymore and wander. We live in our houses, and to many people, 
we're going to retire because of our house. And the thing that you have to come to terms with, and this takes humility, this takes will, this because you just want to tell them how good you are, is you got to find out why. Each client is different. Each client is an individual. They're a person. They're a family. They're a unit. And you've got to start looking at these basic human needs and saying, how can I tap into what really matters to you? How can I help you transform your life and your livelihood versus facilitate a transaction? Look at safety, security, affordability. I mean, you're, we're dealing in a world where we've got things like bully offers and, and beating wars and go all in without inspection. And, and I'm, I'm putting everything on the line. And now when these machines start coming at content and fire hose, they're going to confuse people even more. There'll be way too much data to deal with. The first thing I got to say you've got to be is peace of mind. You're the veterans. You've been to battle. You know what the emotional is at stake. You know how they're feeling, thinking, behaving. You're calming. You're going to let them sleep at night when they put their head on the pillow versus stare at the ceiling all night going, what have I done? Just think of some of the things that your clients ask you. The first thing is, how many times they say, what's the crime in this neighborhood? Well, I'll tell you right now, you used to be able to pull out some great data and statistics. That's available. I could have given you 100 of those things I picked with just a simple Google search. That data doesn't matter. What matters is what does crime mean to the person you're dealing with? Crime is very different to a family that have young children. Crime is very different to elderly people. Crime is different based on your, whether you're single or married, your gender, your ethnicity, how long you've been in this country, your psychology. That's what crime is. It's not a statistic. It's not what happened last week. It's helping them find the peace of mind based on what they view to be risk. Think of all the other things that challenge you in the security of doing a deal. Infrastructure underneath our cities. Let's say I'm moving from the 905 to the 416, or the 416 out to the country. What are the things that are going to matter to me in making this massive transformation in my life? When we use words like downsizing, we're talking about downsizing. We're talking about a completely different world I'm moving into. Will I belong? Will I love it? Will I, will I find happiness in it? I mean, this, this is everything. That the flowers I put in front of my house, that the way I put an awning in front of my store, that's me. That's not a building. That's not a mortgage. That's me. Thinking of the families that are going in there. Were they going to fit in? Are they going to love it? Is their family, their kids, the community? What's going to happen on Main Street? Think about things like purpose. You know, I don't, unless I'm flipping a house, this, this home, I'm going to see my children grow up in. I'm going to see my parents come and visit and get old. I'm going to be transformative. So everything matters. You know, people say, what's the schools like? I don't want you to just think of the schools based on these little kids now. What, are these, what world are they going into? And what kind of education? And I want you to imagine these kids graduating and feeling happy and positive and self with self-esteem based on the decisions you help them make. This new world of gig economy, what's going on? Because they want to be with like-minded people. Hotels are building lobbies now because people are, want to get together and connect. These we workspaces are the future. It's not just because they're affordable. It's because how people are working today. Are you factoring that in when you look at it? And finally, the self-actualization. You know, I, I, I look at these transformative and this aging population and somebody moving into a condo. They want to free up some cash for their retirement or help the kids get a house. What if, what if that client used to love to make jam or fix their motorcycles? What, what, what did they do in the past that made them love what they're doing and how is that going to be altered? And how can you help them through that transformation? Are you going to find a place that's near a community garden? Is there a whole new adult education thing where that maker can get in and be part of it? Are they going to get involved in theater? Are they going to still have an ability to work with their hands, to present tomatoes to their friends and family and saying, I grew this? 
Are you going to be part of a community where people come together? Are you going to be part of a community where people can create and express and share? That is the business of doing business when you become part of the transformation economy. Now we're coming near the end of our quest today. I'm about to say goodbye. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn's Tony Chapman Reactions, I publish a lot on transformation in different industries. But before I leave you, I want to leave you with one final story. It's a time of equally massive disruption. This one was more political. This led into the, the Second Great War. This is a young backbencher at the time, Winston Churchill. Out of favor by both political parties, the opposition couldn't stand him, and even his own party couldn't believe he would have the audacity to write articles for American magazines. You just didn't do that in the House of Lords. But Churchill, Churchill was transformative. He saw what was happening with communism in Russia and the brown shirts starting to unite in Germany and fascism in Italy and Japan's thirst for oil and America becoming the new superpower. And Britain was, thought they could stay in the middle and, and, and status quo and the prime minister just preferred debate and dialogue. Well, one day, Winston Churchill stood up in parliament. He looked at everybody and everybody looked at him. And then he looked at the prime minister and he said, history will prove this honorable prime minister is wrong in these matters. For I and the people of England know it is so, because together we will write the history. And he took the battle on. He used storytelling and narrative. He made people believe. Three years ago, he was recognized as the greatest Britain of all time. So what did we learn on a quest today? The first thing is the oxygen of all Life, all human endeavor, all business endeavor is attention. When you have attention, you have the ability to be transformative. You have currency. The problem is there's headwinds. There's too much and too many chasing a finite amount of time. The consumer consume, has command. They walk into to the specialist medical offices saying, this is the prescription I need because I researched it on the web. They, we're dealing with a lack of trust where we're going, well, you're making all this money. Can I trust you? Which is just seeping sadly into human society. The middle has disappeared. There's no status quo. There's no hanging on. If you're in the transaction business, you will become irrelevant. They will be things faster, better, and cheaper than you. If you're in the transformation business, you will have something that no one machine can ever have. You will have heart. And heart is about empathy and caring and humility and will and listening and generosity and caring about those kids graduating and people sleeping with peace of mind and being able to still dig in the dirt when they make a transformative move or leave the city and fall in love with the country. When you have those kinds of conversations, you're relevant. When you have the time to pay attention to what matters most to me, you become so meaningful. There's no fire hose because you're helping me get to where I need to go. And one of the great Yoda quotes, one of the most important ones is, you have no choice. Make things happen or watch what happens. Be in the transformative or Lose your business and lose your commissions to transactions. Do or do not, there is no try. But if you have the courage, have the will, to stop worrying about being number one and all the deals and all the things that you've done, and instead focus on what matters most to me, instead of telling your story, you become part of my story, I promise you, you will write the history because those that tell the stories while they rule the world. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So I would like to start 
not just with this title, expression, impression, result. But before I actually get started in that, I would like to say a huge thank you. One to Tony. Was that great? It was awesome. What a fabulous message. And number two, Ontario Real Estate Association, let me tell you something. I have been doing what I do for 15 years. I have been averaging 45 cities a year for 13 years. And I will tell you that this association has raised the bar for everyone I ever work for in the professionalism and the attention to detail to bring you an amazing program. So let's make it sound like 10,000 screaming fans are in here thanking this association for all they do for you. Man. It's been amazing. Now, we do not, we do not control the impressions we make on others. So this title, Expression, Impression, Result, we don't control the impression. That is up to someone else. We don't control results. That is a combination of our expression and their impression. I want you to picture something. I want you to picture when you as a child or perhaps what you've done with your children or grandchildren, when we tried to make a finger or a hand impression or a foot impression in plaster or concrete. And the impression that came out had everything to do with the angle, with the weight, with the pressure, and finding the correct pressure points to make the impression exactly what we wanted it to be. And usually when we start things like that, we have to do it several times because maybe we didn't find the right pressure points to get it exactly where we wanted it. That is the same thing that happens with our communications with people. There are pressure points. There are exact ways of expressing ourselves that will create a different impression that will create a result that we want. Well, if we don't control expression or impression and we don't control result, what do we control? Well, Here's what we can do. We can be mindful, very, very mindful of our expressions because while we can't control results, our expressions can absolutely impact the results that we have with people. And we're in a people business, are we not? We are in an, a, a business where we negotiate for everything. We negotiate for a name on the telephone when they call. We negotiate for a phone number from emails. We negotiate for everything we do. Our expression will absolutely not control, but impact the impression that is made on another person, which will take care of results. So, before we can ever, ever even express ourselves to the point where people will listen to us, we need to get by two gatekeepers, if you will. So, people have what we call a cognitive mind map, a cognitive mind map. We are trying to make an impression in someone's brain, a positive impression that will help us get to the results that is good for the client. We can't make that impression until we get through these two gatekeepers. The cognitive mind map starts out here. We're trying to get to the brain. There are two critical questions that everyone will ask themselves about you and me. The first two big, big questions our number one, everyone is going to interact with you and me and they are going to have the first question, do you respect me? I'm a human being, do you respect me? Well, we've got to pass the test. Before we can get to the next level, we have to pass the test. We have to show them we respect them. That's sort of what Tony was talking about. Do we know their story? Do we understand their story? Are we relevant to who they are? So we've got to show that. The second critical question to get further into the critical mind map or the cognitive mind map is going to be, I have a point of view. Do you care about that? Do you care what my point of view is? Once we have passed those two tests and only after we pass those two tests, will people be open to listening to what we have to say? Will they be open to actually considering our point of view? So let's think about this. We have two ways to show that respect and care. The first way to show it, and Tony's um, video about the Evian, that was cute, eh? The, the, the babies and the, and the people. What were they doing? They were mirroring and matching each other. So here's psychologically something that is proven and extremely sound. 
People like people who are like themselves. They are in their comfort zone when they have people who are like themselves. So one of the things that we want to do is maybe mirror and match to help people feel comfortable. They will also feel respected at that point. Now, everything I tell you today usually comes out of a school of hard knocks, a major school of hard knocks. And when I've learned something like that, it's like, oh, man, I've got to help others not fall into the same trap. I was, I'm going to take you back into the 1980s. Cleveland, Ohio is, is my home. And I have been in the real estate business for nearly 35 years now. So I'm going to take you back into the early 90s. And we had a senior manager in our real estate company. His name's Bill Rowe. Bill Rowe was a wonderful man in his 70s who taught me more about life, I think, than anybody at that point. It was amazing. This man taught me about business and life. And you need to understand who Bill Rowe was, though. When Bill Rowe spoke, he spoke methodically. Um, softly. And Bill carefully thought about almost every word that came out of his mouth because Bill never wanted to offend anyone. So he spoke more like this. Please raise your hand if I'm driving you nuts. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So Bill walked in my office one day and he said, Jackie, we need to talk. I said, sure, Bill, what's up? <laughs> he said, well, I want you to picture something, Jackie. I want you to visualize what would happen and what it would look like if a steamroller met a Twinkie. And I said, wow, that's not a very pretty picture. He said, well, that's how I feel sometimes when we talk. And I, I said, no. He said, yeah. I said, well, what would I be? The, the steamroller or the Twinkie? He looked at me and he said, you, my dear, would be, I said, the steamroller? He said, and there you have it. You just finished my sentence. He said, Jackie, do you know that sometimes when we talk, you actually do this? I said, I don't, I don't. He said, mm, you do. Well, I went home that night and I cried. And I was so upset with me. And then I realized he just gave me one of the best gifts of my entire life. Pointing that out to me was amazing. Because I, what I realized was that my outgoing, gregarious, dance on the table, loud, is not great for everyone. And it was literally a lack of respect to not allow him to feel comfortable in my presence. And I learned to mirror and match. By that, I don't mean if he scratched his head, I scratched my head. I mean, we're not monkeys in a zoo. But I do mean that when I'm speaking to someone who is more soft-spoken, a slower pace, um, lower volume, I try to match that in some way. I have found that it enhances that trust and respect level by a thousand times. It's great. Now, the second way to get past that cognitive mind map barrier that we have is respectful listening. Respectful listening starts with questions. And here you go. Tony's talking about their story. How do we know their story if we don't ask them questions? We ask them questions, and we give them if a very effective and careful, intentional, respectful listening. Now, we're not great at that. We are not great at that. Um, if, if you think about it, if you were to gauge people on a scale of one to five, the average realtor, the average realtor, on a scale of one to five, with five being the best listener in the world and one being an absolutely horrible listener, um, go ahead and raise your hands up in the air and, and, and rate them. Get those hands up. Let's see. Are they a one, two, three, four, five? Let's see them. Let's see them. What do you think? What do you think? I see twos. I see twos. I see some ones. I see, oh man, it's hard for me to see too far out, but I'm not seeing any fives out there. Now, there are many reasons we're not effective listeners, but let's think about this for a minute. Number one, there's a difference in hearing and listening. Hearing 
is absolutely nothing more than a sensory gift that we have been given. Now, I do not have an interpreter up here doing sign language, so I'm assuming everyone in this room has been given the gift of being able to hear. That means sound can come into your ears. That's all it means. Listening is an intentional act. It is an intentional, intentional and conscious ability or want to take the sound that comes into your ears and actually process it where it's meaningful and you're literally hearing what the other person says and understanding. It's listening for understanding. It's awesome. The best listener I know in my entire world is my niece. Shannon is 40 years old, lives in San Diego. Shannon was born profoundly deaf and has never heard the English language, ever. She's the best listener I know because she really works to understand what you're saying to her. We aren't like that. One of the number one reasons that we are not like that is that we have internal chatter going on while people are talking to us. I call it my parrot. So I have parrots in my head. First time I really realized how many parrots I had in my head, I was driving down the street going home from work and there was a for sale by owner sign in the yard. I saw the for sale by owner sign and I immediately began talking to myself. It sounded something like this. Oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding me. Why would they put the house on the market themselves? This is my geographic farm. I sell 80% of the homes in here. I sold their neighbor's home in four days and I met these people at a block party this summer. Really? What? Well, that was interrupted by another voice that popped in my head. The other voice was a trainer from the 1980s. His name was Steve Stewart. He had a class called Get Let's see, buy now or get out of my car. I took it four times. Buy or get out of my car. And so Steve's voice popped in my head. He said, would you just stop whining and complaining? Go up there to the front door. You know 50% of those people will list the house with a person who knocks on the door the first day they put the sign in the yard. Go talk to the people. Well, the next voice popped in my head was my mother. She said, don't you dare. That's rude and obnoxious. If they wanted you, they'd call you. And the next voice that interrupted, that was my dad. And he said, don't you listen to your mother. You go right up to that door, knock on that door. Those people are going to love you. Everybody loves you, loves you, loves you. Next voice popped in my head was mine. Two blocks away in my own driveway. And there was a little voice that went something like this. Oh, too late now. <laughs> Honestly, somebody just give me some sign that this stuff happens to you and I'm not alone. Please, <laughs> give me some sign. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, that made me very aware of the fact that I had inner voices. So I started becoming sort of a student of that. And here's what I recognized. When people are talking to me, when people are talking to you, this is a very human thing. So it happens to all of us. We talk to ourselves in our head. Now, that voice in our head might be judging what they said. I mean, I can tell you that I was with a seller that told me what he thought he should get out of his house, and I immediately had an inner chatter that was something like this. Uh, geez, here we go again. So sometimes we're judging it. Sometimes we're planning dinner. Sometimes we're wondering who's picking the kids up from soccer. Sometimes, or I mean, who knows what's going on in our mind, but listen, here's the fact. If we're talking to ourselves in our mind when someone else is talking to us, our auditory system is much closer to our own inner voice, our parrot, than it is to the person talking to us. And therefore, we become an ineffective listener. We cannot know their story without being a great listener. I'm going to give five steps, okay? These are going to run fast. Because unfortunately, when we were in school, no one gave us a class on how to listen to people. We got classes on how to do oral reports. We, I mean, I took speech class four years in a row. I'd love for my speech teacher to see what I do for a living, right? So we learned all of that. We learned to dissect frogs and dissect sentences, you name it. But they didn't give us classes on listening. I'm going to give you a quick one. Number one, become aware of the fact that you are talking to yourself while someone else is trying to talk to you. We are human. It is going to happen. You will not escape it. But what you can do is become extremely aware that it is happening. So be aware that it is happening. Now, while you're doing that, I would suggest that you actually name that inner voice. I've done that. Mine's named Chatty. You can take my name or you can name it something else if you want. But be able to relate to that inner voice. So you want to be aware that it's happening. Number two, we want to quiet that voice. Quiet that parrot, if you will. And be kind to that parrot because you know what? It's our subconscious. Oh my goodness. That's the voice that tells us it's hot. Don't touch it. 
or the, the car's coming too fast, don't turn. So be kind to it. I went to Texas. I said, how do you, how do you stop a, a, a bird in your house from talking when you're trying to rest? And in unison, they all yelled, shoot it. I thought, sorry, forgot it was in Texas. Okay, no, don't shoot it. So what I do is I just, when I realize it's happening and it happens a lot, I say, not now, chatty, which is why I needed a name. Not now, chatty. And for the record, folks, I do not say that out loud. <laughs> okay, just make sure you know that. All right, so that's step number two. Step number three, establish eye contact with the person who's talking to you. This is all happening very quickly. Establish eye contact. It's difficult to not listen to someone if you are looking in their eyes. So establish eye contact. Number four, and I want you to practice this as soon as I start telling you. I want you to make your parrot a repeater of my words. So here's what's going to happen. In your head, not out loud, in your head, I want you to start repeating in your head everything I'm saying. You can follow me word for word, or you can, you can wait till I pause, and then you can fill in the phrase I just said. But in, in any case, however you decide to do it, what you are doing is keeping your inner voice or your parrot or your chatty or whatever you name it, you are keeping that busy with my message and it cannot take a mental field trip. And I'm telling you, if that doesn't make you a lot more money in real estate, it'll save a marriage. So go for it. <laughs> learn it, learn it, and learn it well. And step number five is that what you want to do is take that story that you've been repeating in your head, find a moment to pause the people and let your parrot be a repeater back to them. Let your parrot tell their story. So if I heard you correctly, Tim, you know, here's, here's what you said and you give it back to them. They will correct you if you're wrong. They will know you were effectively listening to them. And sometimes they even correct themselves and say, well, I did say that, but you know what? This is what it is. And I'll tell you, if you practice those five steps, you will be a much more effective listener. And I am, I am sad and sorry that even in today's world, they're still not teaching that to kids in school. That is an important lesson. That's how you learn their story that Tony talked about. All right. So now, if we've shown respect and care, they now have, they're feeling comfortable, they're trusting us. Now and only now will they ever listen to our point of view. When we start to share our point of view, we need to be mindful of three types of expressions that we have out there. Words. Number one, words do matter. They do. The words we choose to use. And I'm going to give you a great example. There are a lot of words. And I see Ray and Amy are over here, and I got to spend some time with Ray and Amy and Laura and, and Val and Barbara and Steve last night a little bit, which was great. And they were talking about some of the words that I've shared in classes in the past that made a difference. I'm going to share one thought with you. And uh, when I do that, I need for all of you to get out of your realtor mindset, okay? I want you to be a real estate seller for a moment. A real estate seller. In fact, can you repeat that after me on the count of three? Just say real loud, I'm not a realtor, I'm a seller. One, two, three. Good. Now, I'd like for all of you to get your hand up in the air with your thumb, and you'll have a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So hands up. The thumbs up literally will mean I like this phrase. I'm a seller and I like it. Thumbs down will mean I'm a seller and I don't like it. Are you ready? I'm going to give you the phrase. Here is the phrase. Show me whether you like it or don't like it. The phrase is real estate commission. Show me your thumbs. Oh, wow. Look around the room. Look around you. Now, I, I see very few thumbs up if you're a seller. If you're a realtor, you're going, yeah, baby. But if you're a seller... Now, the question is, if we know sellers don't like the phrase, why do we use those words? Words matter when we're trying to make an impression, don't they? So for years, since the mid-90s, I have not ever referred to my fee as a real estate commission. It is a success fee. In other words, if you said to me, what do you charge to list my home? I would say I charge nothing to list your home. And thanks for asking, Ray. And then I'll hear the voice going, right. <laughs> of course you don't. No, really. Do you have a moment for me to explain the way I work? Sure. All right, here's how I work. I am going to meet with you and I'm going to see your house. 
I am going to take my time to understand you, understand your goals, understand any concerns you have. I'm going to take my time to get to know your home and the marketable features of your home. I am going to share with you how the market is behaving and how it will impact you. I am going to use my expertise, my knowledge, my energy, my experience, and I'm going to spend my money to get your home sold, and I literally do not charge you a dime for that. For months of work, I don't charge a dime. Now, when I am successful selling your home on your terms, I will charge a success fee. If for some reason I'm not successful selling your home on your terms, I will not charge you for my time, experience, knowledge, expertise, or charge you back for all the hard costs that I have incurred to market your home in this market. I will charge a success fee when I'm successful. Is that what most of us do? We charge a success fee. I'm like, I am not the attorney that charges you $350 or $400 an hour, whether I win the case or lose it. I'm the person who takes the case and I only charge you when I win. That's kind of where I go. So is there a difference in the words I choose to use? Yeah, there are. So words are one. Number two, tonality. Tonality. So just take a look at the people at your table and I want you to finish this sentence. It's not what you said, it's, go ahead. <laughs> See, you all know that. Please don't raise your hand or stand up. But I'm going to ask you to think inside of your head how many of us would be married to the same person we married originally if it weren't for the term, it's not what you said, it's how you said it, right? That is huge. The tonality in my voice is huge. The third is body language or gestures. Body language or gestures. They're huge. So we're going to, going to go through this a little bit. So expressions. In today's world... And please just yell them out loudly so I can hear you. This is a big room of people. What are the most common communication methods that we are using today with buyers, sellers, and other agents? Okay, text, email, and probably some of you are saying even instant messaging, whether that's Facebook or whatever. So text, email, and instant messaging. There you go. And how does that work for us? How does that work for us? Well, you know, let's, let's talk about some things here. I'm going to share an experience with you that happened to me. Again, another school of hard knocks. I was going on a job, my husband's driving, and I'm cleaning up some emails. Now, I have an agent who follows leads for me, and she is phenomenal. She is absolutely phenomenal at what she does. And she literally every week will get with me and say, Jackie, I followed up on this and here's where it stands. I followed up on this and here's where it's... She's phenomenal. I don't, have to, I don't have to micromanage this woman. For whatever reason, and I don't know what it was, but you know, sometimes we just say things or do things and we wonder why we did them. This was one of those moments. For whatever reason, <clears throat> I was reviewing a bunch of stuff and I saw where I had this lead for over a month from a woman from Washington, D.C. Now, I had pushed that lead off to my agent to follow it up because I was on the road for a solid month, and I said, you know, follow it up, see what you can do with this woman. She had done a great job. I sent her an email, my agent, I sent her an email, and the email said this, you aren't still following up with the D.C. lady, are you? Now, let me give that to you with a punctuation. You're not still following up with a DC lady, comma, are you? Question mark. Intent. I know you have followed up with her and followed up with her, and she hasn't gotten back to us. So here's our MO. You follow up three times. If they don't get back to us, they go on a drip campaign, and we hope for the best. That's just the way we do it. Now, why I even ask her that question is beyond me, but I did. You aren't still following up with the DC lady, comma, are you? Question mark. Within two minutes, my phone rang. It was my agent. She was very defensive, and she was very upset. It sounded something like this. I can't believe you sent me that email. Oh my God, do you, 
Do you have any idea how hard I work for you? Do you have any idea what I do? I mean, in fact, I send you emails, I send you updates. I just looked through my email for the entire chain of what's happened on the DC lady. And she said, I'm gonna send you that. I said, whoa, back up the bus. What are you so upset about? She said, the email. I said, which email are you referring to? She said, the one about the DC lady. I said, what do you think it said? She said, I know what it said. I said, well, humor me, help me. What did it say? She said, it said, you aren't still following up with the DC lady, are you? Now, I want you all to think about that. Same punctuation. Listen, you aren't still following up with the DC lady, comma, are you? Question mark. Now, mine was, you aren't still following up with the DC lady, are you? I know you've done a great job. I hope she's on the drip campaign. Let's move on to Greener Pastures. But here's what happened. Here's what happened. Because it was an email, I had words. But I didn't have body language, and I didn't have tonality included. Am I right? So what happened? She put her own in. She inserted her own body language. She inserted her own tonality. She took my words and gave them a very different meaning. Has that ever happened to any of you? You know, and, and it's dangerous. So while our technology is fabulous, while there is a time for email, there's a time for text, there's a time for instant messaging, there's also a lot being missed when we use those and use them all the time and don't recognize when we need to be paying attention, as Tony said, paying attention. That's what we need to do. Um, I became a student of NLP. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Neuro-linguistic programming. It's basically the way that people, per, they process information. We process information auditorily, what we hear, visually, what we see, kinesthetically, what we feel emotionally or tangibly. Um, that's how we process information. Well, in the 1970s, there was a wonderful book that was written called Silent Messages. And the gentleman, the um, Abraham, and I always butcher his last name, it's Miram or something like that, but Abraham wrote this book, Silent Messages, and it was all about the, the power of the tone of your voice and the body language. And NLP has kind of picked up what he said. Tony Robbins will teach this stuff, et cetera. They picked it up. And here's what we learned in that book and has been somewhat of an, an understood thing. 55% of my message today to you, you are, you are processing based on my body language and gestures. 55, that's over half of our message is being processed by the other person. That impression we're making, body language is carrying over half the weight. Okay, 38% of our message is being relayed to the other person, the impression we're making, based on the tonality of our voice. Not what we say, but how we say it. Now, if you do the math and subtract that from 100, I think you're going to come up with 7% is what is left for words that we choose to use. Now, what's in an email or a text? Words, right? And in a text, it's not even words. <laughs> it's little Little, I mean, what does this mean? What does that mean? So 7%. Because of that, if you think about that, every time that we are communicating important stuff through the email and text, we're getting 7% of our message through and we are allowing them to then interpret it and create their own impression with their own body language and their own tonality. So is it efficient? Yes, it is. Is it effective? Not always. Not always. It is not always effective because of what we've just described. So now, all of the important people in the world realize this is a problem. They realized it some years ago. So they came up with an answer for our emails and texts. What answer did they come up with? Emoticons. Voice and emoticons. Think about it that emoticons exist to try to share your expression and your body language with people. That's why it exists. But I don't know. It's hard for me to see in the back, but I will try. If I shade my eyes, I think I can. Raise your hand if you are a person who doesn't really like emoticons. Raise them up high and look around the room. Look, there's a lot of hands up in here. I don't like emoticons. But yet those of us who do like them, man, we're sending the emoticons left and right. And we can get them wrong. We can absolutely get them wrong. 
I mean, I know a man who was sending a very heartfelt message to a loved one, and he was using an emoticon, and he used the, the little emoticon that looks like a brown pyramid with eyes <laughs> because he thought it was a chocolate ice cream cone. <laughs> yeah, not good, not good. So these can work, but they can also be a distractor or not do exactly what you wanted. They're not always there, uh, on target anyway. So what I'd like to do is take you through some research. My, here's my belief. I love, and by the way, yes, I'm a baby boomer. Yes, I am a techie baby boomer. I love tech. Uh, text, I love emails. I love technology. I love all of it. Um, but I also, hopefully, know its place. And what I have discovered is that virtual communication can lack social glue, that thing that adheres us to another person. We're in the people business. We're not in the technology business. We're in the people business. We're trying to learn people's stories to be relevant, just like Tony said. We're in the people business. It can lack social glue to adhere us to these people in a relationship, and it also lacks social clues. So let's take a look at some research. Einstein, Albert Einstein. He is given credit for a quote that whether it was his or not, he's given credit for it. And the quote goes something like this. I fear the day that technology will surpass human interaction because I fear we will have a generation of idiots. Now, what you need to know is that Albert Einstein died in the early 1950s. The technology he was concerned about was the telephone. Guy's got to be rolling over in his grave about now. You know, at least we have tonality on the phone. He's got to be rolling over. So again, I have become a student of this, and I encourage you to, too, because this isn't Coach Jackie telling you something. This is me sharing what is now being researched around the world as a huge issue, huge issue. Some of the research, Susan Newman, she is a wonderful um, social psychologist. She's authored, I think it's 13 books now. And one of her quotes that I pulled out in my reading was that email and text are safe havens for escape artists. And that's true. Sometimes it is much easier to send an email or a text because we don't have to look at the rolling eyeballs that come as a result of the message. We don't have to deal with the body language. We don't have to deal with anger. It's a great place for escape artists. At the same time, is it good to not know that they're rolling their eyeballs? Probably not, right? So Harvard Law Review, this subjects who never spoke were not only more likely to hit an impasse, but they often felt resentful and angry about the negotiations. This was Janice Nader. She is at Northwest University. And one of the studies that she did that ended up in the Harvard Law Review, she put Northwestern students with Duke University students, and they were to negotiate for a car. And they were negotiating via email and text for the car. Well, what the group didn't know was half the group had the opportunity and were advised to get to know one another personally and then negotiate via email or text. The people who actually knew each other, got to know each other, were four times more likely to come to an agreement. Now, I am bowled over. When I go to a class and I teach and I see one real estate professional sit there, look across the room, see a name tag, and oh my, Amy, oh my God. Oh, we did a deal together last year. Hi, I'm Jackie. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We don't know each other anymore. We do not know each other anymore. Four times more likely to go to an agreement. Last one, Harvard Business Review. A face-to-face -face request is 34 times more successful than email. Now, this was Harvard Research. And they went out and they were doing a funding for a good cause. They were recruit, recruiting people to fund for a good cause. And they had some people go and ask people to work with them face to face. And then some simply did it via email and text. 34 times more successful when people ask in person. Pretty amazing, right? So the question becomes, how is it? How is it? that we can increase our ability 
to build a relationship and get negotiations to end up correct and end up the way they should, we can increase those odds by 93%. You can yell out the answer. Please let me know that you've gotten this. How can you increase it? Get face to face and voice to voice more than we are doing right now. Again, there is a time and place for email and text and, and instant messaging. It's great. But when it's something important, when it's something that could be misunderstood, we can do better than what we're doing. And I will tell you that with technology today, there is literally no reason whatsoever that we can't go face to face and voice to voice with people. We have FaceTime, we have Skype. We have, I use a product called Zoom. And it's zoom.us and it works in Canada. And zoom.us, my gosh, I mean, I pay for it because I do all of my recorded webinars that way and I do all of my coaching that way where we see each other. But there is a free side to that where you can have unlimited one-on-one -on -one meetings through computers and see each other. You've got tonality, you've got body language, you've got it all and you don't have to leave the comfort of your home if you don't want to. The technology is there to allow us to be better, more effective communicators. And we're not taking advantage of it. We're locked into this text email thing. So think about that. Think about what you could do to be able to do all of this and still get your message across 100%. And I will tell you this, I have run into the people who say to me, Jackie, I just, all I want is text because I don't email, I don't check my voicemails, I'm busy, I don't have time, da da da. What I have done with that is take it to the next level. And I encourage you to do that because I will say something on this order. So Ray, let me ask you a question. Um, I, and by the way, before I say that, I love to communicate via text. I love it. It's, it's quick, it's efficient, it's great. But let me ask you a question. Do you trust me as a real estate professional working for you? Do you trust me? And look, that's a great question because if he says no, we shouldn't be working together anyway. I want a yes from that person to know we should be working together. Well, of course I trust you, good. Then Ray, text is, is a fabulous way for us to communicate things and get, get information back and forth quickly. When I feel there is something that text and or even email will not totally explain it correctly. And when you're making one of the biggest financial decisions of your life, do you trust me enough to know when we probably need to either talk on the phone or a virtual meeting or in person to discuss this so that you know you're making the right decisions for yourself? Okay, good. Now, when I get that yes from him, that's great. So when and if that occasion occurs, Ray, what I'll do is text you, tell you there's something we need to discuss, and I really want to discuss it beyond text or email, and ask you when it's convenient for you to get together. And we can do virtual or we can do in person, whatever you want to do. And I have never had anyone say no to that. So a lot of times when they tell us all we want to do is text, they don't really mean it. They don't really mean it. We just need to take it to the next level. Does it work? Well, let me share a story with you. I was in Kansas and I was flying home on a Friday night and I had to fly through Chicago O'Hare and catch the very last flight out of Chicago O'Hare to Cleveland, Ohio. Now, no one in their right mind goes through Chicago O'Hare on a Friday night anyway, let alone the last flight home. But you know what? I am like a little golden retriever, tie a bell around my neck, send me across the Rockies. When I'm done working, I want to get home to my husband, Rick, and my kids. That's what I want to do. So I try everything I can, and I emotionally prepare myself for the fact it may not happen. So I get to the ticket counter in, in the airport in uh, Kansas, and they said, look, there's severe weather in Chicago. It's going to delay our ability to land a plane there. So you are not going to make your connection tonight. Would you like to stay in Kansas or would you like to stay in Chicago? We'll get you as far as Chicago, but you won't get to Cleveland. I said, I'll stay in Chicago. She said, all right, that's fine. And you do know since it's weather, it's an act of God and, which not, and we don't cover that a hotel bill. I said, of course. So she hands me something. She said, we do have this pink voucher. Take this, use this system, and you will get the rock bottom price on a hotel in Chicago here with a free shuttle service to and from the airport. Okay, great, that's great. So I take it, I go sit down, I see that um, my hotel brand happens to be on the back. 
So I called my hotel brand that was listed there, and I said, hey, Jackie Leavenworth, and I said, I'm a gold elite uh, person and with your, with your uh, brand, and uh, I need a room in Chicago O'Hare. I'm going to get stranded due to weather tonight. Do you have a room for me? Absolutely, we do, and it'll be this much money. And I said, well, I have a pink voucher here that suggests that I get the rock bottom price on a, uh, on a room. So what can you do for me there? She said, oh, the pink voucher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said, we do pink vouchers, but we can't do that with you. You'll have to call the pink voucher company. Then they call us, they reserve, and then you use that to get your, okay, fine. So I hang up and I call the pink voucher company. And, you know, she starts with, yeah, we have a roadway express for $42 a night. I said, um, not so much. What else do you have? Um, and then we have, you know, a roadway in and we have whatever. And finally, she comes back with a really nice hotel, $69 for the night with free shuttle service back and forth from the airport. Done. Done. The lady very seriously says, now, you make sure you put the confirmation number down and you have your pink voucher because without it, you won't get that room. Okay, fine. I tuck it in a very safe place. I go out and I get my baggage when I get to Chicago. And now it's 1130 at night. I go get my bags and I have two black suitcases on wheels and I have a black backpack and I have a black raincoat down to my ankles with a hood. It is raining like crazy and I look like a hunchback ninja, five foot two. I'm like going through puddles up to my ankles and I get to the bus stop and the shuttle shows up within five minutes. I feel like a very blessed woman. I get on the bus. Bus is loaded. I am in the first seat right behind the driver. We get just to the edge of the airport when the walkie-talkie system comes on and the manager of the hotel says, and I can hear him because I'm right behind the driver, he said, hey, you got to stop the bus, check and see if you have anyone with a pink voucher because if you do, we don't have any more rooms for pink voucher people. He stops the bus, he stands up, he turns around, anybody with a pink voucher? No one else, just me. He said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you off here at the airport because we don't have rooms for pink voucher. I said, no, you don't understand. I have a reservation and a confirmation number. He said, you do? I said, yes, I do. He said, just a moment. He gets on his little walkie-talkie. He said, I only have one, she ha but she has a reservation and a confirmation. And I heard the manager say, I don't care. <laughs> I stood up. I held on to the pole braced myself. He stood up and he said, ma'am, I'm going to have to let you off. We don't have rooms for pink voucher people. And I held onto the pole and looked at him and I looked him right in the eyes and I said, sir, let me start with this. Number one, I know this isn't your fault. Number two, I'm not getting off the bus. <laughs> I said, you are, I, I'm not going to allow you to drop a woman traveling alone off on a dark and stormy night at midnight in Chicago on a curb. So here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna take me to your hotel, just like we planned, and I will speak face to face with your manager and we will figure out what my options are for tonight. So he picks up the thing and he goes, she won't get off the bus. <laughs> Takes me to the hotel. He obviously, after I got off, he had called and told the manager who to look for because there's a sea of people. There's only one guy at the ticket, David. And he looked over the sea of people, he looked at me, and he just mouthed, we have a room for you. And I said, now, here's the thing. He told me they got a cancellation two minutes after, right? Well, <clears throat> um, they had a room, but they didn't want to let that room go. Not for $69. They wanted the 250 or three they could get from the sea of people who needed rooms. He could send his minion to do his dirty work. He could have even done it over the phone. Face to face, he could not. He could not send me back to Chicago O'Hare. He couldn't do it. You guys want a yes from people? You go belly to belly, eye to eye. You learn their story and listen. So please, do me a favor. Stand up for me. Stand up for me. People will give you clues. They will give you clues if we can see the clues, if we can read them. The clues are just like a traffic light, red, yellow, green. They will give you a body language clue to red body language, which means this, stop. I don't like where this is going. Show me red body language. Go ahead, show me and your neighbors red body language. Look at you guys. <laughs> Look, red body language means stop it. Now, is there also yellow body language? 
Yellow body language is caution. Caution. You don't make ne necessarily need to stop, but caution. Yellow body language, I'm doubtful. Show me. Show me. Oh, look. I, oh, I've got this. I got this. I've got, yeah. Caution. I'm not sure I like where this is going. Now, will people show those to you? Yes. Can you see that over email? Can you see it on text? And would it be good to know if you're going the wrong direction with these people? We need to know when to shift. Houston, we got a problem. You've got to readjust. We can't see it on email. We can't see it on text. This whole conference is about change and disruption. One of the changes that has happened in our industry is that we have gone so techy that we have lost the social glue that is necessary to guide people in a process that is the largest financial transaction of their life. Now, there is a green light too, isn't there? Show me a green light. Everything's going great. Keep on going. Show me the green light. Look at that. And folks, I want to say this to you. I, uh, I appreciate the green light that you have given me, the body language you've given me, the professionalism you've given me to be a part of your wonderful conference right here in Toronto. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage a bronze sponsor of our conference, Terry and Warranty Corporation, and their vice president of stakeholder engagement, Ms. Saloni Warich.